Okay, so my name is Matthew Conroy. I'm the curator for the Lipid Maps databases, and I'm describing very briefly this afternoon the shorthand nomenclature for lipids and lipid classification. Um, so it's a talk in two halves, and I'll do it the other way around. I'll talk about classification first and shorthand nomenclature after that. Now, humans naturally want to classify things. If you're looking at that first slide and thinking, why does he have a picture of four dogs, two ducks and a cat on there? You have classified automatically. If equally you were looking thinking, why does he have four black and white animals, two ginger animals and a white animal, you've also classified things. You could have been saying, why are there live trees and a dead tree? You've also classified things in a slightly odd way. And I'm quite glad I'm not in the same room as you are, if that's the case, but you've also classified things. So we naturally want to classify uh, items and there are many different ways of doing it. Uh, no one way is correct or incorrect. Some are more sensible than others and that may, may depend on your particular needs. And we've been classifying lipids for a very long time. Henri Bracanot in 1815 published a paper where he classified lipids into two classes, basically solid lipids and fluid lipids. And then not very long afterwards, uh, Michel Chevreau, who Bill's already mentioned, uh, modified this uh, classification to add lots of different classes of lipids. And uh, Michel Chevreau is one of uh, only very few scientists who has his name uh, engraved on the Eiffel Tower. But before we classify lipids, we have to define what one is. And as Val said earlier, this is a particularly thorny question. And if you have three lipid scientists in a room and ask them to define this, you will probably get at least four definitions. But the lipid maps definition is of a hydrophobic or amphipathic small molecule, which originates entirely or in part by carbon ion condensations of either fatty, uh, thioesters so acetyl-CoA or malonyl-CoA or acyl carrier protein in the case of fatty acids and polyketides, or the condensation of isoprene units in the case of the phenol lipids. So the isoprene unit is a five carbon unit, which can be then condensed together. And in lipid maps, we categorize lipids into eight different categories. Uh, listed there, and I'll go through them uh, steadily and describe each category shortly. And if you want to browse the categories, it's there on the bottom of the screen. And I would share that in the chat, but having um, shared my screen, I can't actually see the... Uh, there we are, I can see the chat. So I've put that link in the chat so you can see the lipid maps classification. I realize, however, I've just shared that with Val privately, which is of no use to, out to the rest of you. So that's the, um, that's the link for the lipid maps classification. Now, having said that, actually, for many of these lipids, um, the glycerolipids, glycerophospholipids, they're really all modified fatty acyls. So you can think of lipids biochemically, there are fatty acyls, special cases where they're added to things, polyketides and phenols. And how the lipid maps classification system works is that each category is subdivided into three further levels called main classes and subclasses. And in the case of the uh, phenol lipids unique to the C10 to C30 isophenoids, there's a fourth level of classification because these lipids are so diverse. So to look at the first class, which is probably um, the most numerous and the most important for many of you, the fatty acyls, 
a very diverse set of molecules derived from fatty acids. So there might be a straightforward fatty acid, or that might be modified in some way to introduce uh, cyclization and unsaturation, further cyclization, uh, unsaturation, and oxygenation make the, uh, the prostaglandins. They can be esterified, so they're wax esters, or esterified further to CoA, so um, important in the biosynthesis of many lipids. Or you can have some really exotic things in the fatty acyls. They can be reduced to fatty alcohols, and this is a particularly odd fatty alcohol from, I think this is from a deep sea starfish, and it's particularly odd with them. Um, four triple bonds in it. You might look at that and think that can't possibly be natural, but apparently it is. I looked at that and thought it can't possibly be natural. But uh, in, um, in the deep sea, there are things which uh, do not exist at all in humans and we think are very weird. So a typical classification for the fatty acyls, you might divide it into the fatty acids and conjugates on the left, which are then further divided according to the functionality, the chemical functionality of the chain, whether it's straight or branched, um, whether it has keto groups or oxo groups or not. Um, fatty acyls will then divide fatty esters, so they've got a, an esterification of the acid group. Some very specific classes of fatty acids, the icosanoids, because they're very important biologically, are then subdivided into their functional roles, the prostaglandins, the resolvins. And you have more classifications of the fatty acyls. If you cyclize them, you can make lactones. And you can see the, the many classes of um, uh, fatty acids. Any molecules in mammals with a triple bond? Not that I can think of, but if someone else can chip in and knows about that, um, feel free. And I'm not going to read the rest of the questions. We'll come to those later. I'll distract myself. So the next class, the glycerolipids, uh, really is one or more fatty acids esterified to a glycerol molecule. So in this case, you might have, we have a diglyceride, two fatty acids attached to a glyceride. You might have three added triglycerides, which are the uh, most of the energy storing molecules in our deposits. Or they don't have to all be fatty acids. In the case of galactolipids, which you found a lot in plants, one of the groups esterified onto the um, glycerol is a sugar, a galactose. And we classify the glycerolipids by what is attached to the gly glycerol. So monoradyl glycerols have one thing attached, uh, glycosyl diradyl, two fatty acids, and a sugar triradyl glycerols, three fatty acids attached. And then they're further divided according to how they're linked. So acyl glycerides will have an ester linkage, alkyl glycerols will have an ether linkage. Now a word on stereospecific numbering of lipids, because I'm not sure anyone else is going to cover this, and apologies if you all know this, but I think it's worth mentioning anyway. The rules for numbering the glycerol are as follows. If you draw the glycerol in this manner, horizontally, like that, with the central hydroxyl group projecting behind the plane of your screens there, then the rules are that carbon one is on the left. So the carbons are numbered one, two, three, from left to right. Thus, that makes this molecule one palmitoyl, two linoleol, SN glycerol. So the stereospecific numbering puts the palmitoyl on carbon one, the linoleol group on carbon two, and carbon three is three. Our third class of lipids, the glycerophospholipids, are really a special case of glycerolipid but they're incredibly numerous in our cell membranes, so we've classified them as a, a class of lipids in their own right. And these are glycerolipids which involve a phosphate, usually at the SM3 position. 
in almost all life, the phospholipids have the phosphate group SM3. In the archaea, there they can be backwards. So the phosphate is at the SM1 position. So the phosphate there is SM3. And of course, that's further modified to make the different classes of phospholipids. So you can have phosphoinositol by adding an inositol group to the phosphate, phosphocholine, phosphoethanolamine, etc. And this is just to remind me that not all lipids have an ester linkage. In the case of the plasmalogen, it's an ether linkage with a double bond next to it, making it a vinyl ether group. And you can make some really complicated uh, phospholipids by sticking two phospholipids together with a linking glycerol between them to make the cardiolipins. The lipid maps classification for glycerophospholipids is like this. So we first classify them by the head group. You can see over on the left, the head group. So the phosphocholines, for instance, are then uh, subdivided into the linkage of the fatty acyl groups onto them. So a diacyl phosphocholine or a 1-acyl, 2-alkyl in the case of um, uh, well, the plasmalogens are then subdivided because they have a vinyl alcohol group. Further subclass uh, class of phospholipids. And then the oxidized glycerophospholipids get a class of their own, and then they're further divided by the head group. And you, this is where classification becomes subjective because equally they could be uh, subdivided in here. Moving on to the third, fourth class of uh, lipids in the lipid maps classification, which Al Merrill is going to talk about immediately after me. So I'm not um, covering these in a huge amount of detail. The sphinger lipids are built uh, from a sphingoid base. Now the sphingoid base is built up from a fatty acyl group and the serine. And it may or may not have a double bond there, and it may or may not have an extra hydroxyl group there. The amide functionality uh, usually has a fatty acid attached, and this hydroxyl can have a head group attached to it, which may be something like a phosphocholine to make the sphinger myelines, and it may be glycosylated with sugar or often many sugar residues in the case of the gangliosides. And we classify the sphinger lipids on the base, basis of the hydroxyls and these unsaturations in the sphingoid base and what's attached on the, the head of the molecule. So like I said, the sphingoids might be divided into the ceramides and then the dihydroceramides, the phytoceramides, depending on the, um, the stereochemistry and the hydroxylation of the base. And then for others, what the nature of the head group is and what sugars are attached or what phosphate group is attached. So that's the sphinger lipids. And then the prenols, which we're moving away now from the uh, fatty acyl derived lipids. These are built from the five carbon isoprene units and they can be linear or they can be cyclized. So we have here a short two unit uh, prenol, uh, uh, an eight unit prenol, the carotenoids, these are C40 isoprenoids, so there's eight five carbon units there, and a highly cyclized one, Bill showed you early that you can take a, a linear prenol in the case of squalene and cyclize it uh, to make the cyclic prenols, which then move on into the sterile lipids. And we divide the prenols up in a manner such as this. So the isoprenoids are divided into uh, different isoprenoids depending on how many prenol groups make up the molecule. And then they're further subdivided uh, according to the definitions by the Dictionary of Natural Products hierarchy into a great many different um, isoprenoid subclasses. The quinones are also in the prenol category and 
polyphenols such as phenols and dolichols, which are very, very long phenol molecules. The sterols really are a special case of the C30 isophenols and the boundaries between what you would classify as a sterol and what would be a C30 isophenol are a little vague and somewhat subjective. But the sterols include the steroid hormones, uh, as Bill's talked about, the bile acid and the vitamin Ds in which this second ring of the sterol is cleaved. So you make a seeker steroid. And someone asked in Bill's talk, are the bile acids classified as sterols? Yes, we classify them as sterols. Um, and then we further classify the bile acids according to how many carbons are in the, the bile acid skeleton. The steroids are a subclass of the sterols and they're subdivided again into the number of carbons in the molecule. So that makes the estrogens and the androgens and the sterol lipids themselves are classified according to that side chain group that Bill was talking about. So for instance, the cholesterols, the ergosterols, the sigma sterols, uh, the latter being from plants, ergosterols from fungi. The last two classes, which I'm going to talk about very briefly uh, are the sacrolipids. Sacrolipids are defined as fatty acyls uh, attached to sugars, but not attached by a glycosidic bond. So they're not glycolipids. I think most of the other classes have glycolipids. And you define a glycolipid as attaching the sugar by the anomeric carbon. So it's by the C1 making a glycosidic bond. The sacrolipids are linked, the acyl chains are linked to the sugar by um, in different positions on the sugar ring. And they're mostly bacterial in origin. So on the right there, we have the, the lipid A for the bacterial surface, bacterial outer membrane. And then at the bottom, uh, a three halos lipid, which are the mycobacteria. And typically we divide sacrolipids like this. So the acyl amino sugars, and then how many acyl chains are attached. Acyl three halos is because the the head group is that two, uh, two sugar unit of three halos and acyl amino sugar glycans where there's further glycosylation of the, um, the sugar units. And then finally, the polyketides, which are a really diverse uh, group of plant and microbial metabolites primarily. And this is maybe one of those cases where Many scientists would argue that these are not lipids or clearly not as, not as clearly lipids as some of the others. And you can see these are a really diverse class from I mean, the resorcinols, the plant flavones, to on the right, the antibiotic vancomycin. And I'm not going to talk very much about the, or any more about the polyketides um, because we're not covering those in a great deal this week and I don't profess to be an expert on them either. So that's the first half of uh, my talk covered a very brief whistle stop tour through um, lipid classification and many of the classes will be covered in more, uh, more detail throughout the week. Now I want to touch on a shorthand nomenclature of lipids, what it is and why we need it. So as Val mentioned earlier, you can't identify a substance simply by weighing it. You can see on these scales, uh, you have something which weighs 620 grams, roughly. If I gave you a bag of something weighing 620 grams, you couldn't tell what was in it without some more information. So there's nothing to tell you that you have potatoes on those scales unless you have more information. This, in, uh, putting this together, this reminded me of a story of someone I knew at university uh, who decided that they could get a better deal on their illicit substances if they all clubbed together in their hall of residence and bought it in bulk. 
and he got the money from all of his friends and went down into the less salubrious part of town to buy in bulk a kilo of their illicit substance. And he handed over the money and brought the bag back, which weighed a kilo. And when he got it back, he discovered he had actually bought a kilo of cheese, probably the most expensive cheddar in the world. So you do not what, know what something is simply by the mass, whether this be a lipid or whether this be cheese or not cheese. So it's important only to report the level of detail that you actually know. And the shorthand nomenclature describes lipids at different levels of characterization, different levels of detail, depending on the information you have. And certain classes of lipids are more amenable to this notation than others. The ones that um, follow the rules more easily. So things like the diverse polyketides aren't particularly amenable to shorthand notation, but the fatty acids and the phospholipids definitely are. So for instance, you might know that you have a fatty acid with 20 carbons and four double bonds, but you may not know where they are or the nature of those bonds. You may even not know that they're four double bonds. That might be a triple bond in there as well, but from the mass, you can't tell. But you might know that the double bonds are at carbons 5, 8, 11, 14. And you might have further information that they're all cis stereochemistry. And when you have that information and all that information, you know you've got a bacidonic acid. But before that, you really aren't sure. You might have a lot of um, what Val called biological intelligence to have a reasonably good guess it's a bacidonic acid, but you can't be certain. So a standardized shorthand also aids the interoperability between software tools. Throughout the week, we'll see lots of software tools to look at, and look at and analyze lipidomic data. And it's really important that all those software tools know what you're working with. So for instance, you might know that on each line, they're all the same things. FA brackets 24 is the same as FA space 24 or TG is the same thing as TAG, or CE for cholesterol ester is the same as Col E for cholesterol ester. But that's easy for a human to do. If you give that to a computer, it really doesn't know. And it's a problem in a lot of software that it will fall over in a heap because there are different standardized uh, names or shorthand names for different lipids in various different systems. So the lipid map system proposes to be a standardized shorthand between um, hopefully that all tools will adopt. I am well aware, however, that this cartoon comes into play when we do this. There are competing standards. So you develop a universal one that everyone should adopt. And now what you've achieved is just one extra standard out there competing with everything else but hopefully we will get to a, a standard standard at some point in the future. So how does this work? We describe lipids at the level of characterization you know that you have. The least detail is the species level. So this shorthand nomenclature here, you first have uh, an abbreviation giving you the type of lipid here. So FA is an abbreviation for fatty acid. You have some information that you know the thing you have is a fatty acid. It's followed by a space, followed by the number of carbons. So you now know you have a fatty acid with 20 carbons. There's a colon that separates that from the number of, number of double bond equivalents. So here there are four double bond equivalents. And I'll talk about what I mean by double bond equivalents versus double bonds in a minute. But you may also have some oxygens in this fatty acid. It may be oxygenated. So if that's the case, you then add a semicolon and the number of oxygens after it. So here we have a fatty acid, 20 carbons, four double bond equivalents and three oxygens. 
and that's three extra oxygens. It doesn't include the oxygens in the carboxylic acid group because, as I said, they're covered by the abbreviation FA. That includes the atoms common to that type of lipid. So here's three lipids, um, all of which share this species level abbreviation uh, 2403. The one in the top left, well, there are four double bonds and there are three oxygens. So this is uh, clearly um, an easy case of four double bonds, three oxygens. This is 2403. But a double bond really is removing two hydrogens from the totally unsaturated form. If you have the lipid on the bottom left, that's also the same case. So the three double bonds between carbons remove two hydrogens, but the double bond to the oxygen to make the keto group also removes two hydrogens from the unsaturated form. So this would have the same mass as the lipid on the top left. And similarly, cyclizing a molecule also removes two hydrogens because you have an extra bond to the carbon as well, so the hydro hydrogen has to leave. So here your four double bond equivalents are the two carbon-carbon double bonds, the keto-oxygen double bond, and the ring. So a double bond equivalent also includes uh, a cyclization of the molecule because these, these three are all exactly the same mass. And with just a mass, you can't tell the difference between them. You need some extra information uh, in order to define that. And if you have extra information, then we have a hierarchy of shorthand nomenclature. So for instance, we take this lipid here. All of these shorthand nomenclatures define this lipid in different levels of detail, depending on what you have. The top row here, you know you have 18 carbons, two double bond equivalents, and an oxygen. You might know where the double bonds are, but you might not be sure whether it's a hydroxyl, it might be a double bond at position nine to a keto oxygen. But then you might know that you definitely have a hydroxyl group there, but not be sure where the double bonds between the carbons are. So you'll have 18,2-OH. That defines it to two double bonds and a hydroxyl group. You might then know the stereochemistry of those double bonds. So you define it in this form, 18,2 brackets 9Z comma 11E, defining those stereochemistries. 13OH because you know the hydroxyl is at 13 position. And then finally, if you know the stereochemistry of this carbon with the hydroxyl added to it, you'd add in square brackets the S, the stereochemistry of that hydroxyl. So S or R, depending on which stereochemistry that carbon is. Only when you have all that information can you define the molecule properly. Without um, this full level of characterization, you can't be certain that you have that molecule. You have different levels of certainty depending on your experiments, but you can't be absolutely certain. Let's take a more complex case. So a phosphated alcoholine here. The PC part of that takes into account all those atoms in the head group. So all those atoms can be removed from the equation. They're taken as red, given that it's a phosphocholine. So the abbreviation now allows you to concentrate on what are the different acyl groups attached to your phosphocholine. Or if you have an experiment where you have several different phosphocholines in your lipidomic sample, you can look at them relatively straightforwardly without dealing with all the atoms in the head group. So PC refers to phosphocholine and takes into account those atoms. The 38 tells you that you have 38 carbons split between the two acyl chains. 
the four tells you you have four double bonds in there, double bond equivalents, and the O tells you you have an oxygen. If you have more detailed information, for instance, you've done a, an enzymatic cleavage and removed one of the acyl chains so you know where the acyl chains are positioned, you might have more detailed information. So you might now know that one of the acyl chains is 18 carbons and no double bonds, and the other is 20 carbons, four double bonds and an oxygen. If you know where they are positioned, then you use the slash to define, to delineate between them. But if you don't know which of the positions on the glycerol those acyl chains are, we use an underscore. So the underscore says, I have one chain of 18 and the other of 20, but I'm not sure where they are. And the slash says, I have one chain of 18 carbons at the SN1 position and the other chain of 20 carbons, four double bonds and oxygen at the SN2 position. If you're describing a triacyl glycerol, you then have a second uh, slash or a second underscore, depending on your characterization to define the third position. The more detailed information you have, the longer, the more detail you put in the shorthand nomenclature. So once you know where the double bonds are and their stereochemistry, you can start defining them there. You know where the hydroxyl is, you put that 12 OH. And finally, once you know the stereochemistry of that carbon for the hydroxyl, square brackets for an S, the stereochemistry of that. So my take home message, you can't infer complete chemistry of a molecule simply from the mass. Uh, you need to report using the appropriate level of detail using the shorthand nomenclature for the information you've inferred from your experiment. Don't be like this paper, which was published in scientific reports relatively recently, where the method section was fairly vague, but as far as I can work out, they only have masses. They don't have any more. They certainly don't have any fragmentation details. Uh, they may have some separation by chromatography, but there was no standards. And if you look at this list of lipids, which was taken from the skin of pregnant women and non-pregnant women of the control, there are some very surprising lipids in here for human skin. So this one here, ladderane lipids only occur in particular um, anaerobic bacteria that live in um, swamps and water processing plants. This is a flavonoid which is responsible for the color of geranium flowers. So you know, it's surprising to find that on, the, um, on human skin. And this lipid is deuterated. That's a standard that you would add in your sample. There is no way you can get deuterated lipids from the, from the skin of a human unless that human has been drinking some very odd water indeed, but that would kill them. So that brings me uh, to the end of this very brief whistle-stop tour through classification um, and an introduction to the shorthand nomenclature. If you'd like to know more, the, the papers on the classifications and the shorthand system are here.